Amen. So we've spoken about the uh, use of first mention. We went to the word parable and we spent some time looking at how that rule works in practice. So hopefully we're all reasonably comfortable um, with how that rule works. Does anybody have any questions? Because I think someone had some thoughts or wants to make a point. But we've run out of time at the end of that last presentation. Um, I, I had an example, but I already shared, but I shared it privately with Sister Janine. An example um, of what? Um, just how um, we can look to the Old Testament or just scriptures and things can be written, but then Sister White takes them in a different uh, line of project. Okay, so it's not a question. Oh, no, no, I'm just going to share that. Any questions? Yes. No? Um, So do you want to, uh, what was the point that you wanted to share? It was, um, it was the word landmarks, because in the Old Testament, landmarks is used as literal landmarks, because um, the Bible says, remove not your, oh, yeah, remove not your ancient landmarks, so it's always in regards to property, but then Ed and White takes that, <coughs> takes that phrase of landmarks and links it with uh, pegs and pins, links it with uh, basically the prophetic lines. Okay. Um, when we were looking at Isaiah 28, uh, you don't necessarily have to turn there. I meant to ask you this before your meeting. Do you need that board? Oh, no, it's fine. I'll just use that one. I can get a head start. Okay. Um, you don't necessarily have to turn there, but in Isaiah 28, maybe it would be appropriate to do that. In verse 2, the back end of verse 2, last part, says, He shall cast down to the earth with the hand. Verse 4, he um, symbolizes the head of the fat valley as a summer fruit, the first fruit, <coughs> and it says, Which when he that looketh upon it seeth, while it is yet in his hand, he eateth it up. So it takes this um, symbol or this imagery of a hand in the context. In verse 2, it's the hand of this mighty strong person. But in verse 4, it, it's using this hand that's grabbing hold of a, a ripe fruit in obviously some symbolic fashion because the fruit is not literal. Um, so I'll give another example of how to use first usage. So we're going to look at the word hand. So if we have a look at that, Sister Pascal, which verse are you in? Are you able to follow? Are you following in English? Which verse are you in? Yeah. We're looking at the word hand. Yes. Which verse is it taking you to? No, I am not. I have not. Um... Oh, okay. You don't. No. You're not able to do that. Genesis 3. I heard you say, I heard you say 3. 
Everybody there? Genesis 3.22? Are you there, Sister Cedric? Genesis 3.22? Looking at the word hand. I'll read the verse. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now let us put, and now lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. This is where he's going to be ejected from the Garden of Eden. Are you okay with that, Sister Cedric? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Tell me what hand means. What is hand a symbol of? We've said the parable, first usage, Numbers 23, um, is prophecy. What's hand? And as you're thinking about it, remember, every time you're going to see hand, it would always have this characteristic. Even if it had another characteristic in, in the verse, you should also be able to see the characteristic that we're going to see here in every usage if this rule is a valid rule and it works. Mm -hmm. Ask your sister Cedric, what hand is in this passage? Um, is it partaking of sin? Um, so you're going to say hand equals sin? Yeah. So every time we'd see the use of hand would be sin. So when we go to Daniel 2, and he talks about the hand, that would be a sinful act when the stone's cut out of a mountain. Does it symbolise like obedience or... Um, obedience? Okay, so let's walk through this together. What is Adam trying to do? He wants to know good and evil. He's trying to help her. He's <laughs> going to just mind with it. No, yeah. <laughs> so what's Adam, sorry, what's Adam trying to do? He wants to know... No, what's Adam trying to do? He oh, want to, know to reach it. out. And to do take, what? To partake of the fruit. So he's trying to reach out and grab hold of fruit. Yeah. And what's God going to do? Uh, take and get him out of the garden. So God's going to remove him, from the stop garden. him. Stop him. Yeah. Yeah. So Adam wants to take hold of the fruit, and God's going to stop him. So, what is the hand a symbol of? Okay. Okay. We'll, 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 we'll go one step further then. When he's outside of the garden, here's the tree. Here's the garden wall. It's a wall there. Because there's a gate. So Adam's out here now. Adam's this big, say. I don't know how big he is. And what's Adam going to try to do? To get to the tree. So he's going to reach out. And what is, what's the problem? Uh, it can't. Why? Because it's something put in Because it's place. too far away. Yeah. So he's been moved out. So he's trying to reach out for the tree, uh, for the fruit, and now he's going to be moved away, so he what? So he doesn't get hold. Okay, so the hand is a symbol of what? Re um, trying to get something. Brother Leo. You had your hand up. Yeah, I was, I was thinking it's more of a um, symbol of works or a decision. Okay, so we're getting close to it. It's a decision. It's a choice. So we'll go with um, choice or decision. Now, when you have a choice or a decision, where is that choice and decision? In here. But it's not talking about what's in here. It's talking about... Action. Action. It's talking about action. So hand is a symbol of what? Action. Making your choices 
or your decisions and putting them into action. So you can have all the choices and or thoughts in your mind that you want, but what you need to do is put them into action. And here, he's going to put it into action here, isn't it? Outside, he's going to reach out, try and grab hold of the fruit, put it all into action, but what's the problem? He can't. He can't because he doesn't have the ability. So I want to suggest that a hand is a symbol of power. Or you might call the ability to do what? To get your choices or your decisions and put them into action. So, does that work for you, Sister Cedric? Yeah. The hand is a symbol of power, his ability to do something. So, once you see this in its first usage, every time that word is ever going to be used in the scriptures, you should be able to see power. Are we okay with that? So, Fred? Okay, so uh, it's choice. A choice is a, a thought that goes in the brain, yeah. and that thought has to be transferred from up here all the way to your hand to actually make a decision to do something. Because okay. he's still making a choice here when he's outside of the garden, but it's not doing any good because he's he's being forced by someone that's more powerful than him um, to prevent him from doing what he wants. Because his hand is still doing the same thing, but it doesn't. It's not able. Doesn't have the power to grab hold of the fruit that it did when he was when he was on the inside. Uh, so my sister, if you're okay with that, is that fine? Me? Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. I, 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 so I said choice. Yeah, yeah. So you okay with power? Well, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of. Yes, I know because a power means a, your ability to put yeah, your choices into ability. action. Because yeah. you said action. Yeah. It's so more ability, I feel that than power because he, he doesn't have the power to reach. He did here. No, but he, he didn't reach. He, he, he doesn't have. When the, he had, when he was here, he could. Yeah. yeah, but not when he's there. Because his hand doesn't have the ability. Yeah. Or the so power to do something. He doesn't something. have the power now to reach. Yes. So that's why the word power can be ambiguous. What would you prefer to use? Um, the, 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 the uh, trying out, or uh, he has the ability. He has the okay. Will, the will. Well, the will is a choice up here. Yeah. It's not that it's not. Yeah, but the will is put into action, as you said. Okay, so, so I'll put if you if you if you prefer action, action here. Yeah. Or ability. Yeah. I think they're all synonyms of power. Yeah. If you're okay with that. Yeah, I mean, you have the power, but. So that's not my question to you. Yeah. My question isn't that. My question is in Daniel chapter 2, explain the use of the hand there. Find the verse for you. Someone will probably find it before I do. Um, we'll go to Daniel 2, verse 34. I think someone's already shouted that out. Mm -hmm. 34. Yeah. Daniel 2, verse 34. Before you do Daniel 2, verse 34, um, Tell us Daniel 2, verse 38. I'll read 2, 38. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven, hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. <coughs> you okay with that? Tell us what hand is, how hand is being used there. Nebuchadnezzar's hand. 
So what is hand a symbol of? The power. Power. So you're okay with it? So it's the same usage as we've just found in Genesis. Exactly the same usage. You okay with that? Yeah. So it's following the rule. Everybody, everybody okay with that? 238. Mm -hmm. Everything's being given into his hand. We could have said, you have control of everything. You have power over everything. It says, in fact, you have, you have been made ruler over uh, everything, them all. So we see it's, it's, <coughs> the rule is working. Mm. Let's drop back four verses to verse 34. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet, that were of iron and clay, and break them into pieces. So let's paraphrase that. You have a mountain. And my sister, what's happening to the mountain? What's it saying in this verse? Are you talking about Yeah. Mm. But there is a stone coming out of the mountain. So, I put that there's a stone in there. Yeah. It's not really, yeah. I don't think that's the correct imagery, yeah. but there's something in there, and the stone is going to be cut out. So here's the stone. Mm -hmm. What else? How? Without hands. Okay, so this was hands-free. No hands. Is this you? It's just that I come back to the, the verse before because it says, you give power into your hands. It, the verse before you mean 38? Yeah. yeah. It, it gives the power into your hand. Mm -hmm. um, it's it, because he's a king. You know, it's like it's it's. A king has power, but it's more under your dominion. Okay, uh, I'm happy with that. I'm done with verse 38. This is Babylon, and he's in charge of everything. He has power over everything, dominion over everything. Yeah. So we're okay with that. Yeah. He's following the same rule, and his power, yeah. his ability to decide the fate of nations. Yeah. I want to know how you're going to do it in verse 34. In verse 34... He says, the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands. Explain that. It, it was not man's intervention. It was no, no so you're saying, um, not man's intervention. Yeah. Full stop or carry action. on? Okay. No, no, it doesn't come from action of man, okay. choice of man. It doesn't come from the power of men. Okay. Uh, you know, to come back to... Is that all? Is that all that means? No, because everything means something else. <laughs> but, um, so the stone was, was, not, was cut out, but it wasn't through man's intervention. And you were saying not man's power. How was it cut out? So before you answer, what did we say about parable teaching? Sorry? Compare and contrast. We made another point. If I have a hand in the side, I have to... There is an end in the other side. You understand what I say? Are you saying, did you say hand? We, we compare two similar things. Yes. So, um, so I'll give you a clue, the one that I'm looking for. You've got two battleships. Mm -hmm. And when they come to each other, what must they both do? When they fight with each other? Win. They follow the same rules. They have to follow same the same rule. So... The rules of nature have to be the same rules as the spiritual. Okay? So, there's a mountain. And you're going to do what to that mountain? You saw this before? You're going to cut something out of that mountain. What do we call that word when you cut something out of mountain? Hewing or quarrying. We're going to quarry a stone out of the mountain. We're all familiar with that. 
Yeah? So if we're going to do it that way, we'd have this mountain and we'd say, we're going to quarry this thing out and take this stone. You know, normally we put stone square, but stones often look like that more often than not. You're going to hew or quarry this stone out of the mountain. How do you quarry stones out of a mountain? What do you need to quarry a stone out of a mountain? A tool. A tool. So you've just got a spade just lying there. That's not going to do anything. No. What do you need? A hammer. An excavator. A hammer. Yeah. Sorry? No, you've got a tool. Whatever the tool was, there's the tool. It's just lying there. It's not going to do anything. What do you need with the tool? Oh, you need to use the tool. The with your hands. With your hand. So in the natural, what must there be to cut this stone out of this mountain? Hands. There has to be a hand. And you just said, it's not man's hand, or not man's power. But to take a, a stone out of a mountain, what do you have to have? Hands. You have to have a hand. You agree with that? Yeah? Because the natural has to follow the same rules as the spiritual. So if it's not a man's hand that's doing that, someone's hand must have done that. So when it says no hands, it not only means not man's power, it means... Because someone has to be able to do that. God. So not man's hand, but God's intervention or power, intervention of power was... The hand. That's what that hand was. You use those words to symbolise or to understand, explain what hand means. So it's God's hand that's doing that. So this is another point about using these parables and how they're supposed to operate and how they're supposed to work. Now why is that important to know that? The reason why it's important to know that is because there's another story that Jesus is going to give about stones being cut out of a mountain. Mm. The cornerstone. It, 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 it's not, the, the cornerstone is spoken about Christ, yeah. mm. but he's actually going to have a conversation about quarrying stones out of a mountain. What story, what conversation is that? He says, your name is this, oh. and I'm this. Peter. This yeah. is Peter. So, yeah. so Pe he says, Peter, you're what? The stone. A stone. Mm. This one, mm. and I'm what? The rock. the rock. I'm this one, I'm the mountain. Mm. And do we know where they're having that conversation? On what the... mountain it's on? Sorry? Not a horeb. No. Not Olivet. No. Yeah. It's Mount Hermon. Mm -hmm. And the reason they're having this conversation on Mount Hermon is because just down below them in the valley, they can see a city. And that city was made of what? Stones. I would guess. Of stones. <laughs> and they're on this mountain where there's a quarry, and they've quarried all these stones out and made that city down there. Yeah. And I know Elder Jeff knows this, but what is that city? Jerusalem. Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi. And long ago, Caesarea Philippi was called Panium. So you've heard of the story of Panium, where we place at Midnight Cry. All of that story is now associated with Daniel 2, a stone cut out of a mountain, not with human hands, but with God's hands. So when you start taking these parables and applying them properly, because the parable itself, or the word just says, not with man's hands, that means it's hands-free. Mm -hmm. It does not mean hands-free. I've put hands-free here, but it doesn't actually mean that, does it? It doesn't mean no hands mm -hmm. when it says without hands. It does mean with hands. Can we see that? Mm -hmm. When it says without hands, it actually means with hands. It means the opposite of what the English words teach. Because what it actually means is not human hands, mm -hmm. but God's hands. Now, I've heard, I've heard, I and my sister helped me have added a whole heap of words here to a simple phrase that says, without hands. And people are going to turn around and say, you just added a lot of information that isn't in the scripture. Now, prove what you're doing. 
And can you find a, a verse that's going to prove all of that? No. Alan White won't comment on it. There's no words. All of that, we're going to get accused of just making that up. So have I just made all of that up? No. That it's, well I say me, my sister did it all for me, not man's hand, uh, but God's hand. We didn't make that up. This is how parables are supposed to work. But you have to know some rules. You have to know that when you go from the literal to the symbolic, that in the literal, if you want to take stones out of a mountain, you need hands to do that. We agree with that. You need hands to do that. And therefore, in this, there has to be hands. This is not hands-free. This is hands-on. Now, I've made it look simple because I've not given all the information. What we would do is proof text without hands. When you proof text that phrase, you will see that it actually shows you in the four or five places that's in the scriptures that it's not human intervention, it's God's intervention. So you can proof text that. But I'm not proof texting this, I'm just doing this from the methodology of parables built upon those rules. It's not logic. And when people see this, they think this is just using logic, human wisdom, and it's not. It's clear to see it's not with human power that this is happening, but it's with God's power. So the words that say without hands means with hands. All based upon methodology of parable teaching. Once you can see that, then you can launch into, as I just said, this is Mount Hermon, this is um, just above Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi is Panium, and Panium is the midnight cry, as we understand it. So you can begin to see all of this. Just want to add one more piece of information. Does it mention any tools here? It does not. We all know you cannot quarry rocks out of a mountain barehanded, with bare hands. You have to use a tool. So then what you would do is, you'd say, if a tool is going to be used in the natural, there must have been some extraction tool here. And then you'd start searching what is a tool in the hand of whom? God. In God's hand. When does he start using tools and what purpose do they have? And then we would begin to discover that the tools that he uses are existential, they're separate or distinct from the thing that you're trying to deal with. In the literal, it's obvious. You have a mountain. You have three things, a mountain, a hand, and a tool. If we were to say this mountain is what, what would you say this mountain is? Don't say Christ. What is a mountain a symbol of? No. Kingdom. Kingdom is a much better definition. Uh, you could say, because the church is a subset of a kingdom, because of ancient Israel was both a nation and a church merged into one. Church and state, if you like. I'm going to call it a kingdom. So, this is the kingdom of heaven. This is us, God's people. There's a hand. This is God's hand. He's going to do something. And what is he going to do? He's going to quarry out of this kingdom a stone. And he has to use a tool to do that. And that tool is a third party. Are we okay with all of that? So what you can begin to see when you want to start making prophetic application is that out of this kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, which we would perhaps call the SDA church, he's going to have to use an external instrument, a tool, to extract this stone out. When you start using this symbology, can you see how clear it is to know that the stone is not Jesus? I mean, it's obvious when you start thinking about it intelligently, carefully. I don't want to say people are not intelligent, don't need that way. So, if we were to say that this stone, is this stone powerful? Does it conquer? What agency of God, of his kingdom, is able to conquer and has power. Who is that? The church triumphant. I wanted to get one, one, one step below church triumphant. 
Sorry? I'll, I'll just go to Ephesus, if you're okay with that. To conquer and to go to conquer. This is Ephesus. So if this stone is Ephesus, and we say we're Ephesus, we're the church triumphant, how do you get cut out of the SDA church? The message. There has to be this tool, which you want to call a message, but if you start checking back into Old Testament scriptures, and you see what these tools are that God uses. Prophecy. Parables. Prophecy. 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 I want to say it's... Men of God. Uh, men of God. It's, it's nations or kingdoms or people. It's separate distinct elements that are used. You find this used over and over again in the book of Isaiah, and I think also in Jeremiah, you see this imagery being brought to view. God uses tools to do things to people. So we might just, you know, the reason I'm mentioning this is because more often than not, we say it's the message, the third angel's message that cuts us out of this uh, um, mountain. And I'm not saying that's wrong, but what I am saying is that tool is not the message. I would argue that that tool is a nation or an external force that's been applied to us to wrench us or to cut us out of this mountain. To say it succinctly, it's external events that are cutting us out. Now, I'm not arguing that it's the third angel's message, but the third angel's message is an internal dialogue between us. And, the, and who's giving that internal message? We are. So we'd, we'd be saying, we cut ourselves out of this. And I'm saying it's God's intervention in the affairs of the world that are going to cut us out. It's the circumstances or the events that are happening all around us that are producing this. And the premier ones would be 1989 and 9-11. It's those external events that have cut us out of this mountain. Of course it's our understanding of it, but they're external things. They're not just us you know, studying the word and doing something. You can get all of these thoughts and ideas all in agreement with what we teach when you start taking these rules and start applying them in a way that I, I think is quite powerful. And we've only scratched the surface on, you know, on what we could do with a, a relatively common prophecy that all of us are familiar with. Can't we just say prophecy? Because remember at the beginning of your first presentation you said that that's what prophecy is, those external events. The prophecy was seen to be the delineation of events that, um, that bring you down to the way to this earth's history. There is the historical events that are symbolised. Yes. No, I just think it's interesting you say that because in Isaiah 10, verse 5 and 6, it talks about the Syrian being the rod in God's hand. Um, and we know when they came, they, <coughs> at least the northern tribes, they took away and then left, left the poor. So it's kind of like they cut out a certain class of people. Um, even at the time of, let's say, Daniel, when the Babylonians took Daniel and his people, it's, it's the, the things that they did that cut Daniel and his friends out. You know, like the, the image the, the image test. And even when you think about the, the Sunday law, that that's what's going to separate or, or cut out um, a certain class of people from another. Um, we went to Isaiah 28 verse 5 I believe it mentions the word residue we didn't go to Isaiah I think it's 6.13 that talks about the remnant um, well what other ones have we already discussed um, Ezekiel can't remember the verse Ezekiel 9, where certain people are left and others are not. We've already mentioned Jeremiah, um, <coughs> Baruch, and Gedaliah. They're left by Nebuchadnezzar's <coughs> general. You see this concept about these nations, in these particular cases, they were, all, you know, they were Babylon, that separate and cut out 
two classes of people. So it, it is a message. I'm not, I'm not trying to say it's not a message, but it's much more potent than a message. It's by understanding the event. And the reason why I say it's not just a message, because how many people in Adventism teach the third angel's message? You know, everyone. Everyone is an expert on the third angel's message. And we know, if we would say what the message is, it would be the message of the third angel. That's what produces this separation, the third angel's message. We might call it the message of Laodicea, uh, if we wanted to um, talk about it in that sense. Uh, but I'm saying it's these external events, specifically, that make the third angel's message have this power. So, are we okay with, with the subject of hand? That it, having, that it means it's a symbol of power, the ability to do something, the, the ability to put your choices, your decisions, into action. And I gave a simple example. Um, we went to chapter 2, verse 38. You can, it, it's easy to see the hand there means Nebuchadnezzar's ability to rule, to have power. Easy to see. Then I took us to verse 34, which is not so straightforward, see, because it says no hand. And my sister said, it actually means not man's power. <clears throat> and I said, if it's not man's power, it needs to be someone's power, because we're going to go back to the rules of parable teaching, that the laws have to be the same. The natural and the spiritual laws have to work in the same way. If you need a hand here, you need a hand here. And if it's not man's hand, then it's obviously must be God's hand. And so what... At first appears to be no hand actually means it is a hand. Hopefully that was instructive of I'm not teaching you things you don't know. What I want to teach you is a methodology of how to approach this in a much more systematic fashion than perhaps we have done before. Because if I were to ask you, um, maybe not everybody, but most of you go, when it says without hands, I'm sure most of you would have said, yeah, that means God's power is going to do it, or the message will do it, which is the right answer. But I wanted us to, take, to, to, to go through the steps on familiar passages, which is, I think, how we should be teaching and understanding. You go from the familiar to the unfamiliar, to the simple, to the complex. And so this is a passage we're all familiar with, and I'm saying we could approach this <coughs> in this systematic fashion, and you can see how you get the answer in, in a way that's much more comprehensive, and I think is defendable, like you're not making it up. And so I want us to all be encouraged that um, not only do the, the rules work, but that you can apply them, because you know, we've just done it now amongst ourselves, as best we can on these example. You'd have to do it over and over again to become familiar with it. Any questions on that? Um, so, I, I understand that, you know, the, the tool in God's hand can be these external powers and these sort of nations that God uses, like the Babylon and the Chaldees and so on, but um, at the same time, I, I understood that God can use um, sanctified men, if you will, um, in order to be a tool. Okay, so I'll, let's go with that. You said sanctify. Yeah. So I'll, my question is, what's the definition? What's your definition of sanctify? Set apart for holy use. Set apart um, for holy use. Was Nebuchadnezzar set apart for a holy use? It was. Yeah. Was Cyrus? Yes. Was Napoleon? Yeah. Yes. I'm going argue he was. <laughs> he had a holy use to put down the papacy, to divorce them. So you can start getting to modern people. You know, when we start thinking about what the actual words mean for a holy use, you know, when you're doing God's bidding, that's a holy use. It's his story. It's his directing the rise and fall of nations. He setteth up kings and brings them down. So I, I just wanted to see how that would tie into, you know, this whole model of it being these external powers. It's just that you wanted to make sanctified people nice Christians. Of course.
I'll just think what day, it's Tuesday today, isn't it, yeah? So, let's kind of um, diverge a little bit now. Go into um, a separate subject. There's, there's many more things that I want to do, talking about parables and how they work, but let, let's kind of, relate it, but let's talk about a, a new, different subject. Um, all about methodology, really. How we would approach a problem. So what I want to show us is not how we did approach the problem, but a suggestion of how we could have, um, and I don't want to say how we should have in the sense that we did wrong, but I want to say in the sense we should have done it this way because this would have been a better way to do it. The this means how we would have developed our message. If, if you if have I confused anybody what I'm talking about. How did we develop this message over the last 29 years? I'm saying we should have, could have, developed it this way, the way I'm going to suggest. But we didn't. We did it a different way. <coughs> this is not a critique on we did it the wrong way or a bad way. So I know that people may, perhaps will, infer that that's what I'm doing, is like, having the, an attack upon the way we have done things in the past. It's not that. I believe that if we had approached it this way, we would never have actually got to where we are. It wouldn't have worked. The way God has done it is the right way. Is that, have I lost anybody? Yeah. What? Is there a book? No, but, no. Um, Remember we spoke about Numbers 23, Balaam, the star, the wise men, the magi, remember that? Mm -hmm. that's, why I want, that's why I emphasise that point, because it's an illustration of how God takes control of a situation and says, it will be delivered this way. And the way he decides to deliver it may not have been the right way, in our thinking, we may have thought to do it a different way. But he knows which way is best. And I think Brother Tom said, interesting to see that they get Balaam's prophecy, hack it to pieces, rebuild it in their own image, and move along. And God was directing all of that. Are we okay with that? Is that a fair representation of what he said? Probably not. Um, of what I was suggesting anyway. They get Balaam's prophecy, they hack it to pieces. I'm saying that, not he say that. And when they do that, God says, yeah, hack away. Do what you want with it. Turn, the, turn Jesus into a harbinger, into a sign. You know, oh, if we're okay with that. So this is not a critique on the we did something wrong, but I want us to see how methodology would have directed us to do things. The reason why I want us to see that is because it can help us into the future. That's my purpose of doing that, of this. So, I've already spoken to us with three different models. One of them was rain. The second one was what? Love. Marriage. No. no. First one was rain. Second one was his Agriculture. No, not agriculture. Oh, rain? Will it rain? Oh, rain. Rain. I've said all of these in previous presentations. I'm talking about what we spoke about this week. I gave three different models. <coughs> three? Ten virgins. Okay, so if we've got the ten virgins, you'll pick the third one up. You'll remember the third one. Second angel. Second angel, I think you get it. Okay, the second angel's message. And I'm saying all of those three... <laughs> all of those three models all have a repeating pattern and the repeating pattern I drew it like this do you remember that? yes? testimony one Testimony 2. Upon the testimony of 2, a thing is established. 
Therefore, we know the structure of end time prophecy. We okay with that? This history here for rain is what history? The disciples. So that's the disciples. And this is? So this is the event just before the close of probation. Just before the harvest. She doesn't define when it is. We might have different understandings of what that is. I would suggest, you might disagree, that this would be 1798. Some people would come up, <coughs> under Sunday law, some people would come, some people would, more often than not they would put 9-11 there, because they say 9-11 is when the latter rain begins to be poured out. I'm saying it's 1798. I'm open to correction on that. I don't know if, if, if we have some clear definition of how that would be. I'm saying 1798 at the time of the end, this is when the final events are going to sort out this generation until you get to the harvest. So this is the rain model. T1 T2. Testimony 1, testimony 2. Upon the testimony of 2, a thing is established. I'm saying this is how I would suggest we would be able to define what our history looks like. We never approached it this way. Parable of the Ten Virgins, what history is this? I just say never, but you know, people may have. This, tes this testimony here for Ten Virgins, what history is that? That's the Millerite. This becomes 1844. This is Italian time, and you can quite nicely lay out the parable of the ten virgins. This would be, the whole of the 46 years would be the gathering of the virgins. They all come to the bride's house, and they're all here waiting in 1844. And then they tarry, they fall asleep, um, there's going to be a cry, the bridegroom comes, he takes them to the house, there's this falling away, all of that. We can all build that up. And based upon these two models, we can then take Parable of the Ten Virgins into our own history. Remember we discussed the, the, that passage yesterday. Um, 15 MR, 282 paragraph 2, I think. Was that, was that the right one? Where we spoke about the time of the end. Do you remember that discussion we had? And people said, well, how would you approach it? I'm saying my approach is to know from, its, I guess, experience, that when Ellen White talks about the time of the end, the only one she's ever going to talk about is 1798. She's not going to slip in somewhere, by the way, there's this extra one that you never heard about. She doesn't do that. It's, it's extremely rare, very rare, that she ever talks explicitly about our history. And I'm, with, with a caveat, she speaks about the last portions of our history, but not the beginning portions of our history. And this is another important concept that we should pick up. More often than not, like 90 plus percent, all inspiration talks about the culmination or the end of the event, not the beginning. It's almost always that way. And it throws us. It's very rare that a scripture will talk about the beginning of an event. So, this approach I think is extremely important because it helps to give us a methodology of interrogating our own history. And this is not just sort of going back into history. I'm sure if we got familiar with this, it would help to understand and explain what's also about to happen. So we've done it with the uh, Rain and Ten Virgins, Second Angel's Message. This one here, is the Millerite history, and this one here is our history. Again, the arrival of the second, the empowerment of the second. If you like, Revelation 14, Revelation 18. Based upon that argument, would we say that Revelation 18 is the fourth angel? <coughs> it's a rhetorical question. I'm going to say no, before anybody says yes. <laughs> um, I'm saying no, it's not. This model would teach you that it couldn't be so. Revelation 18 is the empowerment of the second. It's not a brand new angel. And if we build upon the other models, Pablo of the Ten Virgins is running through this history all the way through. The rain is going all the way through. Upon the testimony of two models, 
the third model is established. The second angel, when it came here, in the history of the Millerite, it never left. All that we're identifying in Revelation 18, verses 1 to 3, is what, therefore? That now, this angel that has says, Babylon is fallen, Babylon is fallen, Babylon is fallen, what's he saying now? That, he, that, that he's just going to change or add some information to? This is about the end. It's reached its that's all he's saying. The cup is full. And all he's been saying all this way is he begins to fill the cup, whoever the he is, the cup begins to get filled, and it's filling all the way through it, and now it's full. That's what Revelation 18 is saying in reference to Revelation 14, verse 8, verses 1 to 3. It's the same message, because it's the same angel. I think I mentioned this, I don't mean it in class, but... If this is the earth, and this is Revelation 14, and this is Revelation 10, the first angel is where? Flying through the midst of heaven. And in Revelation 10, the angel is where? It's landed upon earth. We can see this characteristic between the two. It flies, and then it lands. And we mark Revelation 10 to be the empowerment. So this is the empowerment and this is the arrival of the first angel. If you go to verse 8 of Revelation 14, it doesn't tell you where that angel's located. Neither does it tell you in verse 9. The only one that's flying in the midst of heaven is verse 6. So an angel flying in the midst of heaven, it doesn't tell you about the other two. But when Ellen White comments on Revelation 14, she tells you that these three angels are doing what? They're all flying in the midst of heaven, if we're okay with that. So this is Revelation 14, the first angel's message. Where's the second? I'm saying the second here is also flying in the midst of heaven. And Revelation 14 here is the arrival of the second angel. You come to Revelation 18, and what's happened to that angel? It's come down to earth. This is the second angel's message. It's come down to earth. And now what's happened? I'm saying it's empowered. Just doing line upon line methodology. Just by compare and contrast, which is parable teaching. Using all those things. You know that Revelation 18 is not the fourth angel. It is the second angel. And you can prove it just through this simple structure. Just through this simple pattern. It flies, it lands, it flies, it lands. And we have such strong evidence that this is the first angel's message. We, we know that. Uh, Alan White tells us that. It's not, it's not guesswork. So, this, this idea that here the angel lands is a symbol of empowerment. So, just want to, um, for us to observe that. So, once we start working out this, this model, what we want to do is follow the counsel and the guidance of the spirit of prophecy. So what you can see here is that I've in fact developed a line, a line that Alan White is going to explain to us and give us information on. So if this was 1798 and this was 1844, we know that history is straight out of the great controversy. Those events, those dates are given to us. She gives us more than that. And then, towards the end of the book, she's going to give us the Sunday Law, the close of probation, and the second advent. I think we've done this so many times, people are now you know, really familiar with this, with this modelling. This is all taken out of the great controversy. Every Adventist who is serious in their studies and intellectually honest would agree with that. What we can do is to take that line of history and to create on top of that a template. And I guess this is where I threw people before when I said rain and what the other ones, people started talking about marriage and construction because they've heard you know, studies like that before and that, that's where you, you would tend to go. So I'm going to take that 
response that we had before. And I'm going to overlay on top of this as a check to make sure this is all correct, an agricultural cycle. And if I do that, I'm saying this is a preparation stage or what we would call the ploughing. And this then would be the former rain, the latter rain, and harvest. Now, some of this we get from the Spirit of Prophecy, and some of this we get straight from the Bible. This harvest we get straight out of the Bible. You'll see it here if you look um, at the bottom left hand corner of the 1850 chart. You see that Christ and his angel have sickles. This is um, around verse 13 14 of Revelation 14 to the end of the chapter. It's the harvesting of the world. And if you were to read the, the chapters, there's Christ and an angel, and there's two other angels. So there are three angels and Christ at the back end of Revelation 14. Christ and an angel are going to reap or harvest, and the instruction is being given to them from other angels who are in heaven. The only point I want us to see there is that there's two harvests, or two people harvesting, that are identified in Revelation 14, an angel and Christ. So that's given here. This is Revelation 14. Alan White is going to talk about the latter rain. He's going to connect the latter rain with what we would call the loud cry. He parallels that with previous histories, which is why we start putting the midnight cry here. I think we've discussed this. And then she talks about the former rain. It's not often that she talks about the ploughing. But if you're going to run this cycle, the scriptures point to us that there's going to be a plan. She does speak about it uh, sometimes. So once we've got that model, then we can do, I think, some important things. So what we want to do is, we know Ellen White focuses about the end, but she's living here and she says, we're here living in this former rain history and we need to prepare for the latter rain. You know, there's many, many passages of admonition. Like, what are you doing, brethren? You're receiving the mould of the world, and you're preparing yourselves to receive the mark of the beast. So the mark of the beast is going to be in this history here, and you're preparing yourself to receive it, because you're not getting ready in this history. There's, there's many similar comments that she's going to make. So what we want to do is, we're going to take a concept that she says, we're now in the judgment of the dead, the investigative judgment, that would be here, the investigative judgment of the dead. And she says sometime in the future, there's going to be the investigation of the living. And she associates the judgment of the living to occur when the latter rain is going to be poured out. She does that, you have to tease that out of her writings, it's not an explicit statement. So I'm going to put the judgment of the living here when the latter rain begins. And she says, no one knows when you're going to transition from the dead to the living. We don't know when that's going to happen. But we are suggesting that God doesn't do anything without first telling us or pre-warning his people through his prophets. So what we've done is we've gone into this history and we, we're saying, we want to know the steps that bring you to the Sunday law. And the way we do that hopefully we all know, is through Daniel 11, verse 14. And when you get with Daniel 11, verse 14, we get the verse and we split it into two parts, part A and part B, and we identify this as 1798, and we identify this as an event that repeats but mirrors 1798. In 1798, the King of the North and the King of the South have a, a fight, the king of the south wins, and verse 40 part B flips that around because Daniel 11 verse 40 is a chiastic structure, you can demonstrate that, and when it all goes through the wash, we say this was 1989. What we now understand is that it began in 1989, but it ends somewhere in the future. So if you wanted to be technical about it, what we're saying is that verse 40 part B is not actually 1989, it's actually the Sunday law. Because the verse tells you when the king of the south is swept away. 
not when it begins to be swept away. But when we approached this subject, what we did was, again, we followed a principle or a rule, we followed some methodology without realising what we were doing. And what we were doing was taking a history, because this is 40 part B, that takes you to that Sunday law, and begins here at 1989, or what verse 40 says is the time again. All of this is verse 40 part B. And the verse points you to this event here, not this one. It points you to this event. That's not unusual, because if you go to Revelation 14, verse 6, it says the first angel's message was doing what? Flying in the midst of heaven, and who's he speaking to? Every nation, kindred, and tongue. When does the first angel speak to every nation, kindred, and tongue, according to the way we normally study? 1840. Is that correct? One foot on the land, one foot on the sea. But we mark verse 6 as what event? 1798, time of the end. In 1798, time of the end, there is no message going worldwide. So what we can see is that verse 6, 14, 6, and 10 is a repeat and enlarge. 10 is a repeat and enlarge of 14. And verse 14, actually, if I take this kind of analogy, and this was 1840, and this was 1798, verse 6 is pointing to this event, and Ellen White's going to tell us we want to understand the beginning of the verse, which is not coded in the word. It's another example that if you just read the words, you don't get the answer. You have to use a method or a system to be able to take this all the way back. And most of us in the movement, we've short-circuited that understanding, and we've just said, Alan White said it's 1798, therefore it's 1798. It's one of the rare examples, and it is rare, that she will take a spirit of prophecy quote and bring you back to the beginning of it. Sorry, she'll, a, a Bible verse. It's, the, it's a rare time where she'll take a Bible verse and point it out as a beginning, not where the Bible verse is, which is the end. And in fact, when she talks about subject, she's always bringing you to the end, not the beginning. Hopefully... If I, have I, have I confused anybody? Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Almost always, inspiration, whether it's a Bible verse or a spirit prophecy quote, is always talking about the end, not the beginning. If you go to Revelation 14, 6, the language, if you were to read it carefully, will tell you it's 1840, in, that, in the framework of what we're discussing, not 1798. But Alan White's going to say this is 1798, so we, we say 14... 10, Revelation 14, Revelation 10, we do that because we're understanding that Revelation 14 is covering a period of time, it's a history, and the words direct you to here, but we can say it began here. That's how long that verse is, 42 years, in a particular context. So when we come to verse 40, verse 40 points you to this event here. Revelation 11, verse 40. At the time of the end, Daniel 11, verse 40. At the time of the end, the king of the north shall come against him as a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen. That's this. He's overflown and he's going to pass over. It's talking about the culmination of that. And what threw us, what tripped us, if you like, is that we saw at 1989, stroke 91, the demise of the Soviet Union, and we saw, oh, that must be the fulfilment of the verse. And it was not the fulfilment of the verse. There was a lot more history involved in that verse. And what the verse was really showing was this event. But we had correctly identified, because that's what we were raised to do, was to identify the beginning of 40 part B. But the words don't direct you to 40 part B. They were directed to 40 part B at the end. Does that make sense? So we're already doing what God's... We're already doing God's bidding without realising it, if we can say... If I can say it that way. So when we come to realise 
verse 40 is this history, and we say, oh, we made a mistake, because um, this is, the king of the south is not Soviet Union, it's Russia, and we sort of say we made a mistake. Maybe that is the correct way of explaining it, but what I want us to see is that work was being directed by God. It's not a human mistake. If God had not directed us to go to the beginning of the history of the verse, in opposition to the words, we would never have had a movement. It, we, our movement would have never been created, because we would have lost this history, and it's this history that is this movement, if I can e express it in that way. So, let me summarise, because we've run out of time, is that we're going to take this history, and it's been developed through a line that we can take from the parable of the Ten Virgins and the Second Angel's message, based upon the story of the rain, where Ellen White says that the history of the disciples takes you to the latter rain at the end of the world that ripens the earth for harvest. I'm saying that ripening of the earth for harvest began in 1798. So I'm going to take the rain line, and it's this one here, this line here. I'll take the other two, and they're as Ellen White gives them. The, they begin in 1798, and they go all the way to the second advent. So we've created this line, and I'm saying it begins here in 1798, the judgment of the dead, the judgment of the living. We want to know when we're going to enter into living territory, and we're going to get that information from Daniel 11, verse 40. We take the verse, it's a chiastic structure, part A and part B. Part A gives you 1798. Part B gives you the Sunday law with the words. But we now understand, because even though we weren't conscious of it, that what we were called to do as a movement was to identify the beginning of 40 part B, not the end. And the end what I pointed to here are the words of 40 part B. That's what the words bring you to. Just like Daniel, uh, sorry, Revelation 14 verse 6, first angel's message brings you to 1840 contextually. But Ellen White says, no, it's 1798. That's how we should understand this verse. We're going to use that principle to come back into 40 and say, when does 40 part B begin? And it begins here in 1989, at the fall, or the beginning of the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, the Berlin Wall. And the way we did that was using this chiastic structure. I'm not saying we understood the chiasm then, but we came to the right answer because we were commissioned to begin to show, to identify the beginning of this part of the verse, not the end. So only now that we've come to realisation of all of this, and in connection with that, we identify that the King of the South was not the Soviet Union, it was Russia, which means that there's a lot more history involved in all of this. But all of that is all identifiable in the words themselves. If you get the right methodology, it's, it's all laid out for you. So I'm not trying to make a point of whether or not we made a mistake or we didn't make a mistake, but what I am saying is... When we identify 1989, if we hadn't done it that way, the movement would never have been created. Because we would have automatically gone straight to the Sunday law, where every Adventist will take you, and you have no, you have no information to get from 1798 to where? To the Sunday law. So if we had read that as written, what line would we have created? The line that's here on the board, which is the line that Alan White actually gives us because she's going to follow the bible kind of verbatim if you like and she's going to create this line which is the line that daniel 11 verse 40 gives you hopefully that makes sense and i haven't disturbed anybody but what we have been done been raised up to do is to say hold on a minute we'll go to verse 40 we'll do everything that ellen white tells us except when we go to part b we don't want to pick up the words of the verse. What we want to pick up is the beginning of that verse, the second half of the verse, just like Ellen White told us to do here. And when we do that, we have 
great light. And the great light is that we are now given the information that is able to decode when we're going to start dealing with the judgment of the living. When you realise it, what appeared to be, you know, us as human beings stumbling over these words and coming up with all of this and it all looks straightforward, see how sophisticated it is and how relatively complex it is and how easy it would have been to get it all wrong if God had not directed human beings to do his bidding, if we hadn't known to go to the beginning of the verse. And if we had done all of that, we would have met so much resistance, maybe we would have just given up and said, no, we can't do that. We, all that, what we, you might think is glossing over information, I'm saying is the wise men looking at the star and saying, we think the star means this. When the original intent meant, actually, verse 40 part B is bringing you straight to the Sunday law from 1798, because this is verse 40, the Alpha and the Omega. But what we have cleverly done is saying, we agree with that, but the Omega of that verse is a period of time. It's not an event, just like this one was an event. So the verse itself, if you wanted to draw it this way, would look like this. I guess I'm going to, if this is the extent of the verse, I'm going to have to sort of do it this way. That's not a history, it's a singular event. This is part A and this is part B. Part A is a, a singular point and part B is a period of time. And what the verse teaches you is you go from this one, which is 1798, to the Sunday law, if you followed the wording. And God raised up this movement not to follow the wording. This has been embedded in our history since the very beginning. You can see it when it's explained. So when we start saying, we'll take some statement, and we're just going to reapply it in a way that we like, and people say, you can't do that on faith. What authority do you do that? I'm saying, we've been doing that for 29 years. And nobody spotted it. I'm not saying nobody, but our opponents never did. Sister Emma. I think I'd say it is a point in time, but it's two points in time. So, so you're, cause you're saying it's A and then B is a period. But I think the problem we had is we're seeing points instead of a period, which was brought out with Midnight and Midnight Cry. So in one sense, they're the same point, but another time you have to see the period. Because you have to see the beginning illustrated in the end. So he needs us to see two points there, because we have to have 1989. Which point? Show me where you can find 1989 in the words. The king of the north comes against the king of the south. And does what? And enters in, but doesn't fully overflow. The whole thing is not fulfilled in that point, but you have to see that point. I think you can see that point, can't you, in the verse? I would argue you can't. You're saying it's all at the end. Yeah. But I'm saying in the end... There's Just like in process. verse 6... You can't see 1798. It has to be given to you. If you were true to what the words teach. It's given to you what supernatural? No, Ellen White gave it to us. Okay, so Ellen White gave it to us, but we were required to see the end illustrated in the beginning. I don't, I don't know, I think I'm seeing it. Because you want, to, you want to define end the beginning the way you want to. I'm saying the beginning 1798, the end is here. Here, when is the king of the south done away with, which is the omega of the alpha? It's not 1989. No, it's not completed until then. No, it's not 1989, because you want to say it's not completed. The verse gives you an Alpha and Omega if you want to do it. If you want to follow Alpha and Omega, the Omega is the Sunday law. It's not 1989, it's not Panium, it's not Midnight, it's not any of that. It's a Sunday law. Yeah, Sunday law. But when you say it gives you the Alpha and Omega, where does it give you the Alpha then? The Alpha is 1798. The alpha well, so the is. No, I was following what you said. You brought the concept of alpha and omega. You wanted to do that mm -hmm. when you said that. The alpha of the verse is 1798. It's not 1989. You want to do a fractal or something. I'm not sure what you want to do by making 1989 an alpha, and then making. I, I thought that's what you were doing. Making Sunday Lord the omega. I 
I don't want to bamboozle you with words. Yeah, no, I, don't. I don't think that's what she was saying. No, no. I'm not sure what you were saying. She was saying how we always taught it. Show me what the words identify 1989. I'm saying those, no, those words are a clustering, it's a sentence that says all of this is going to happen. And all of that happens at the Sunday door. But you want to stretch that, that sentence out and make it a process. I'm suggesting that it's not. How did you? Different thought. Uh, you're putting the, the Omega at the Sunday law, and I get it. You're probably right at one level. But if the Alpha is the war between the King of the North and the King of the South, doesn't that war end at Panium, not the Sunday law? I'm going to argue no, because if I can express it this way, probably bad analogy, the King of the North, America, is going to light a fuse at Panium that's not going to come, that's not going to blow up the country by the time you get to the Sunday law. The, the Russia, the King of the South, is not going to come to its complete and full end until the Russian populace are going to dethrone their president. They're going to do that work. I don't think the King of the North will do that work. For They're them. going to do it when the Sunday law hits the United States. They're going to do that from Panium, and it's, they're not going to be able to do it in a day. It's going to take them some time to totally get rid of their leader from the midnight cry to the Sunday law. By the time you get to the Sunday law, they've got rid of him. Some new person has been put in his place who is now compliant. So I, I, I'm not trying to undo to say that there's this engagement at Panium at 11.15. I, I'm, I'm not disparaging or arguing that. But when that is done away with, I don't think... My understanding is Russia is not just going to come off the scene of world's history, that Putin will still be there, but a chain of events have been is, is initiated that his, now, his throne is now in jeopardy. And it's, it's, the Americans have left them to their devices and the people of Russia will bring him down. Okay, well, I'm just talking about your Alpha and Omega. I would argue for you to do that work that he, he breathes his last breath at the Sunday law. But I don't care, I get your point. Okay. Uh, Pyrus doesn't die till Beneventum, which is 272 BC. Mm. So he dies at 46 years old, and then Thury is completely... You know, invading whatever it is overturned. So that is the Sunday one. I've run out of time. Escaped. Sister Emma. <laughs> Before we close, let me just summarise so that what I'm going to pick up tomorrow is that I want to develop this line. I'm saying the verse itself gives you <laughs> 1798 to the Sunday law. And what we've done is we've created this new point, which is 1989, in agreement with, I'm not arguing Alpha and Omega, but we've picked up the first part of verse 40, this, this way mark here, which isn't in the words, and we did this through the Lord's intervention. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm suggesting. So when you just did A and B, you said A is, is part A is a point, it's 1998, on the right, sorry, and then B is a process. It's this period of time, it's yeah. Period. I think I'm still Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and mercy. We ask and pray for a blessing upon us. Help us, Lord, to um, be able to handle your word in a way that would be pleasing to you, that would be correct and they'll give you glory and honour. Be with us and guide us, Father, as we press together in the study of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.